Hi everyone, um, welcome to today's webinar, The Future is Floating. We have over 1,500 people registered today, uh, which is great, and thank you in advance to all of the speakers who I will introduce shortly. As you all know, this webinar is one of several pieces of work that we're doing in conjunction with the US Offshore Wind 2020 conference in Boston, which will be held in June 18th and 19th. So before we start the webinar, I'm just going to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit more about the conference itself, where floating wind is one of the main three key components. So the conference as a whole incorporates all of the key areas that the industry has asked us to focus on in 2020, and we're expecting over 2,000 attendees, including 200 plus speakers, um, including the three here today. Um, and they will be all across three main tracks, several workshops, and a new supply chain accelerator program. Um, we've already confirmed um, Etienne de Croix, the commercial director from Elofi, Habib Degar from um, Aquaventus, Scott London, the head of permitting for Equinor, and Julian Simon with EDF, along with Ala Weinstein, who's got today the CEO of Castle Wind. Um, and other speakers from RWE Renewables International, NYSERDA, EMBW, Angie, Equinor, Bascalis Offshore Marine Contracting, G Renewables, Atlantic Shores, and Avangrid Renewables, and many more that can be found on our main Reuters Events Offshore Wind website. So um, this year we have created the first Supply Chain Accelerator Program, which is a series of workshops focused on boosting the local, hyperlocal, and um, international supply chain for offshore wind, which will connect tier ones and developers with smaller tier twos, threes, and fours uh, companies working across offshore wind. Um, in a nutshell, it is the essential place for any company looking to partner develop projects or enter the supply chain. Now, for this week only, um, and for the people who have registered to this webinar, we are offering free VIP conference ticket upgrades to the first 60 people who register before this Friday. So in addition to all of the features that our conference offers, the VIP pass will allow you direct access to hundreds of offshore wind sea level executives in the VIP lounge, plus you'll receive uh, the full executive experience with access to enhanced all-day catering, fast-track registration for no queuing, reserved front row seats in conference sessions, charging stations, and relaxed seating throughout the whole day. So you can register today through our registration page on the U.S. Offshore Wind Conference website and use the code 5092VIP. Um, that offer expires this Friday. Um, so before, to not you know, waste any more time, let's move on to the speakers. Um, I would like to welcome today Alan Weinstein, um, CEO of Castle Wind, um, who will be discussing the ways in which floating wind projects can be executed um, effectively in the US. After her, we will have uh, Dr. Kate Freeman from BVG Associates who will be providing a levelized cost of energy analysis for floating wind in comparison to fixed bottom and highlighting any uncertainties and implications. And finally, we'll have Randy Mail with Green Giraffe, um, who will present ways of financing utility-scaled floating offshore wind projects. This webinar will last for approximately 60 minutes, and the recordings and slides will be sent to you next week. So without further delay, I will hand you over to Alla. Thank you. <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever the time zone you're in. It's a pleasure to be able to present to you um, Offshore Wind. Show my screen. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, whatever time zone you're in. It's a pleasure for me to present to you um, uh, Offshore Wind in the United States and how you would start a project. Um, I will give an overview of what it takes to develop an offshore wind project, and some of it may or may not be repetitive to you, but so it be. So to start with, um, who, is, uh, who is Castle Wind? Castle Wind is a joint venture between Trident Winds, a company located in, Washington, in Seattle, Washington, on the west coast of the United States, and ENBW in North America, uh, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of ENBW, a German utility.
And we joined forces together to develop an offshore wind project in California. It was originally proposed by Castle Wind, by, by Trade and Winds back in 2016. So how do you start a project and why would you do any project development in the United States? Well, NREL, which is the National Renewable Energy Lab, has done an estimate of the wind uh, resources available offshore in US. And you will see based on this map, uh, where the purple color and the darker color gives you the highest wind speeds, that there is plenty of wind available on both coasts of the United States. There's obviously a little bit less of it available in the Gulf of Mexico, but between the north, um, the Great Lakes, the east coast and the west coast, we do have a lot of wind. If you look at the water depth that's available for development of this, wind, we'll see that on the east coast, you will find locations that are in the water depth less than 60 meters. <clears throat> which is compatible to the North Sea in, in Europe. But once you get out in the Northeast, the Great Lakes or the West Coast, all those resources will be in deep water, which will be greater or deeper than 60 meters. And that obviously requires floating support structures. And that's why the floating, the floating market potential in the United States is actually could be greater than the fixed foundations. And as we all know, we're at the beginning of the floating market, but that is where the future is. So going further to kind of estimate how much energy is available, back um, in 20, I think 17, uh, US Department of Energy and uh, Department of Interior put forward national offshore wind strategy. And they estimated that between all areas on the East Coast and the West Coast, you can get to almost you know, two to seven gigawatts of actual energy generation. Uh, that is important because that is the technical potential, not just the gross potential. And that's you know, a significant amount of, uh, of energy. I'm sorry, I meant to say two terawatts, it's 2000 gigawatts. Now that is between both fixed and floating foundations or floating support structures. But if you look at the Pacific, um, obviously, the Pacific region has a significant amount of floating offshore wind potential, and that is what we'll be focusing on. So just to give you an overview of uh, the fixed foundations, as you know, majority of them have been installed in Europe. They fit, sit on the bottom of the ocean floor where the floating foundations will be floating and moored to the bottom of the, of the ocean floor. The floating foundations uh, eliminate some of the major uh, roadblocks or headaches for the fixed foundations. You don't need supply vessels, heavy lift vessels that you can actually assemble everything on shore and put out in the ocean with a small uh, uh, tugboats. And that is significant, especially for the country like US where we do not have supply chain the same as it has been developed in Europe. So the floating market per se does have a much greater potential than the fixed foundations uh, market, but that's all kind of up and coming. Now, if you look at the US and look at uh, where can you develop what and who owns what space, it will be very different than it is in Europe or other parts of the world. But what's important is that within the three nautical miles, you're within what's known as a state waters. State jurisdiction extends into the area called uh, state submerged lands, even though it's part of the territorial sea that extends to 12 nautical miles, it is owned by the state. And so if you are within the three nautical miles, you will be dealing with a state permitting regime. Once you pass the three nautical mile area, then you will be on an outer continental shelf. And that outer continental shelf is owned by the United States government and the Department of Interior. Uh, and within the Department of Interior, it's a Bureau of Ocean Energy Management that is authorized to lease ocean floor for the development of the offshore wind. It is important to know that when we talk about auctions in Europe, they would mean that you will get um, uh, a site, you will get a power purchase agreement, you may get permits, and then you just have to develop the project. In United States, when you do an auction, the only thing you get is the bottom of the ocean floor. Everything else has to be done by a developer. That is a major difference between auctions around in Europe in the United States, and it's important to realize what they mean. So when we go to the kind of uh, the areas, who does what, 
as I mentioned, the outer continental shelf is managed by um, uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. It comes from the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act of 1953. But then in 2005, the Energy Policy Act authorized Boeing to actually do the leases. The Boeing is not authorized to do national parks, national monuments, or national sanctuaries. And you can look at the Boeing website and all the activities that they do in the process that they have to follow. State waters would be managed by states, and they will vary for each individual state with different rule regulations, and you have to check that. But when you come to the National Marine Sanctuaries, those are managed by the National Atmospheric Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, and they have other rules. They, they have very different rules than on the BOEM. And so if you want to develop something in the sanctuary, you will have to deal with a different agency, and then they will have to tell you how to do it. Um, when we go to the projects that have been announced and are in development, there is a lot of activity on the East Coast. All of those projects right now are in the shallow waters. There have been a number of auctions, and I'm not going to go through them, but you can see that there is a lot of activities on the East Coast. We're going to focus on the West Coast, where there is a lot less activity. However, the water depth require floating support structures, and effectively, the activity started back in 2000 13, when Principal Power submitted um, uh, uh, an unsolicited lease for Oregon to do a wind float, for, wind float Pacific, which a project did not move forward. But then the next step was um, uh, there is a test site in Oregon managed by Oregon State University for wave energy development. And then in 2016, Triton Wind submitted unsolicited lease request for the area in California. That in itself started the development of offshore wind on the West Coast and in particular in California, because right now that is really where all the activities are. Now, we all know that the floating offshore wind is up and coming. Uh, by 2021, we probably will see installed capacity of greater than 200 megawatts in UK, Portugal, Japan, and France. And we're hoping that in not too long of the future, we will start seeing commercial project. But what's important to realize that by the end of 2021, we will have already uh, over 50 megawatts of installed capacity in UK and Portugal combined. And these are pre-commercial projects. We're past already the point of technology demonstration, a prototyping, we now moved into the commercial exploitation. So looking at California, which is where most of the activities are taking place, you will see California has a very, very long coastline. However, a lot of that coastline is uh, used either by uh, the Department of Defense of the United States or marine sanctuaries. And so when you look at the wind resource, often though the resource is very good in the north, the north doesn't have transmission lines. When you look at the resource which is adequate in central California down to Point Conception, that area is uh, heavily used used by Department of Defense. And even though the Department of Interior has full rights to the leasing, they have to negotiate the use of land, or use of sea rather, with other stakeholders and in particular Department of Defense. So in, 2000, in 2018, following the unsolicited lease request from Triton Williams, that was in 2016, when Equinor expressed um, a competitive interest, it moved into a competitive process. So at the end of 2018, Boeing published a call for nomination and information, and 14 companies expressed an interest in developing sites in California. There were areas in the north of California, which is shown on the left-hand side around Humboldt Bay, and it's called Humboldt area. And there are two areas in central California called Morro Bay and Diablo Canyon. Since then, since we're now in 2020, what has been happening is negotiations and discussions with Department of Defense because even though there is no uh, military um, conflicts in the north, lack of the transmission prevents expansion of that area to any significant commercial size projects where the areas in central California that are large areas, they have to require negotiation with the Department of Defense. So in, um, um, and, and that's what kind of started the dialogue. In 2019, Castle Wind commissioned a study with a company called E3 that does all the modeling for 
California Public Utilities District and California Energy Commission, and they determined that installation of offshore wind of California in the range of um, seven to nine gigawatts will actually benefit California significantly and allow them to meet uh, its climate and energy goals with almost $2 billion worth of savings. Also, because offshore wind profile is very steady, it, um, it, it, it allows it also a most valuable resource between all renewable energy sources. And you will see the graph on the right that shows you solar, onshore wind, out-of-state wind, and then the blue line, the bright blue line is offshore wind, presents the most valuable resource. California has an issue with what's known as a duck curve. When solar goes away, what do you put on, on the line? And today it's speaker plants, and theoretically, offshore wind can replace those speaker plants. So this is kind of the result of the study, and this is what I mentioned, seven to nine gigawatts will be economic by 2040. And at the same time, it will save ratepayers almost $2 billion worth of, um, uh, of money. And that study is available on the Castle Wind website, and you're free to, you, to look at it. But it's important to realize that offshore wind is an important resource for California. Um, two weeks ago, actually, yeah, two weeks ago, California Energy Commission published a map, uh, which is what you see in front of you. Uh, as a result of negotiations with Department of Defense, they identify areas that could be suitable. There will be a number of public meetings happening between now and the middle of the year to see whether they can or cannot be developed. And that will allow us to know when and how fast things will progress in California. As you notice, the Diablo Canyon is not on this map because the area is heavily used by the military and that's probably not going to be possible to utilize uh, in near future. But for today, we have to wait to those public sessions. And I welcome you to look at Boeing's site, website and California Energy website for the webinars that will be happening in the next few months. So where we are right now in the process, we are actually at the beginning. The call for nomination information took place. We now kind of right in between area identification and waiting for the resolution of and not and uh, proposed sale notices that will come out from the ballroom. So if you want to know how many permits you have to get in California, uh, in particular, it, uh, offshore wind wins a jackpot. It's 33 permits and licenses that will be between federal, state, and other agencies, including Native Americans. And that's what we have to go through. So even though it is difficult, it's worth it because the future is floating and we have a very long coast on the Pacific, in the Great Lakes, and in the northeast of the United States. That is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ala, for that um, really interesting discussion. Um, next, we have Kate Freeman from BVG. Um, over to you, Kate. How is that? How am I coming through? Yeah, great. Lovely stuff. Okay. So, what I'm here to talk to everyone about is the future of LCOE reduction for floating offshore wind. Um, and one of the reasons that I've been asked to do that is because at BVG Associates, we do all sorts of things about LCOE. And over the past few years, as floating has become more important, we've been doing LCOE for floating offshore wind as well. So the first thing that I need to uh, get us to look at, uh, slide in there just for your information about what we do, uh, is the differences between the different types of technology and floating. So for some of you, this will be uh, absolutely normal, normal information. For some people, this might be the first time that they're seeing some of it. Uh, as Ala mentioned, there are different types of the technology. Uh, they all have um, drivers in terms of how they respond to the environment, whether they are very stable, how they respond to wave and wind loading. Uh, there's also uh, an element which is around how you can manufacture them. So you're looking at something which is 
uh, very stable, but is that going to then cost too much? Um, then the next driver listed there is how they scale with turbine rating. So when we're looking at very large turbines for bottom fixed offshore, uh, can that scale across to floating offshore? Uh, and finally, on that list is, can they be used in all ground and meta ocean conditions? Now, they, uh, they each have different uh, variations with that. The semi-subs uh, and barges may be not so uh, stable uh, in terms of the, their dynamic response, the, the wave loading can move them around, but they've got anchoring, uh, which is potentially quite easy. They're um, big structures, so the manufacturing's maybe a little bit harder, um, and they scale reasonably well with turbine rating. Spar boys, on the other hand, the manufacturing is very easy, nice and stable uh, because you're using the uh, deep spar going far down the water column to keep everything uh, upright. Uh, but the manufacturing, while uh, nice and standardizable, you do have some difficulties getting everything to site because everything's so deep. And then the tension leg platform. Uh, you're able to do some nice standard manufacturing. You've got some very uh, stable um, positioning, uh, but the, the tension lines that hold it to the seabed mean that the seabed conditions need to be uh, quite specific. Uh, and also that you've got a structure which isn't so stable in transit. So there are some issues around that. So it's the, the three pieces that you'll always be thinking about. Uh, and they have some shared challenges. Uh, it's potentially always quite difficult for manufacturing and installation uh, in comparison to bottom fixed, just ensuring that you've got enough uh, key side space. However, potentially you don't need such large vessels, so you do get a benefit that way. The um, Replacement strategy, if you're looking at large components, uh, it might be possible to tow to shore or you may be looking at some very large floating cranes. Uh, all of them have different ways of dealing with it. Um, and all of them have different ways that they can be optimized and cost reduced. But the real tell will be what happens when we put these in the water. Uh, and finally, uh, there are not very many in the water, a lot more than they were three years ago. Uh, but until people see that, there's potentially an issue with confidence building in the supply chain. So where are we at the moment? Alice started us uh, off up to where we are now uh, and looking ahead through to about 2035, moving from those demonstrations through the early commercial projects and then to full commercial projects. Now, we've got one projection here at PVGA. Other people might disagree with that. I fully expect they will. <laughs> uh, uh, but you can see here how we've broken down. Initially, the balance is mainly in Europe and Asia uh, with then um, the US West Coast coming online uh, in small quantities in the very late 2020s. Um, so let's look at the costs. Uh, if we if we look at the um, offshore wind band for bottom fixed, uh, we can see it coming down very rapidly in the late 2010s. Uh, to uh, cover those projects that we're potentially more familiar with through the early 2020s, the kind of prices that we're seeing there. Uh, and we'll see that uh, continue to have cost reduction through the late 2020s and the early 2030s. But we can see that there's uh, become a, a sort of more standard range of LCOEs, and that's covering uh, the different site conditions which are available, so even within bottom fix you've got different water depths. Also, uh, the kind of locations within port, the seabed conditions, uh, and of course the wind speed. Uh, we've overlaid here uh, our projections for floating offshore wind cost of energy. Uh, and at the the moment, here we are in 2020, we're looking at something which is really quite a lot higher than the uh, bottom fixed cost for equivalent projects. Uh, but 
this early piece, it's all looking at those uh, demonstration projects. And so those are very small scale. They won't be typical of what happens in the industry as a kind of comparable piece. So if we're looking to the early 2030s, that's where you're starting to get a better comparison. You're looking by that time at uh, 10 gigawatts or so of offshore wind, sorry, of floating offshore wind that's in the water uh, with the uh, turbines connected to grid. And in comparison, that's still going to be very small in comparison to the volume of bottom fixed offshore wind, but it will give you something which is uh, commercialized and got a lot of standardization within the manufacturing. Um, uh, a piece that we can think of that for um, how good does floating need to be in comparison to bottom fixed? If we just think about um, the types of sites that you get for floating offshore wind. One of the pieces that people have been going after in uh, Europe and Asia is that you can access sites which are windier. Now, I grant you that in lots of the US West Coast, there just aren't any bottom fixed sites. But if we think about, um, just so that you've always got a comparison there with bottom fixed, if we think about how much windier does a site need to be for an increased uh, capital expenditure. So rule of thumb, if you increase the wind speed from say 9 meters per second to 10 meters per second, but if you increase it by about a meter per second, you'll get a 12% gain in annual energy production. If you're gaining 12% of energy, that's something that goes straight through into the levelized cost of that energy because you're getting more energy for approximately the same cost. Now, if we assume that the OPEX costs between bottom fixed and floating are approximately equivalent, which especially for projects with similar water depths, they would be. Uh, and if we assume that the CAPEX is approximately two thirds of the contribution to the LCOE cost wise. So that's not just the spend, but the uh, financing of that spend as well. We're looking at a capex which is 18% higher, or three over two of our original 12% of AP. So you can have a capex 18% higher if you can get a one meter per second windier site. Now, the kinds of things that we're expecting within uh, floating offshore wind is to have a capex which is more like 20 to 25% uh, higher than bottom fixed. Um, so you're looking at something where one meter per second is going to get you uh, a reasonably equivalent kind of a cost. So just bear that in mind when you're uh, looking at sites, locations, markets and that uh, sort of thing. Um, but we do have some issues and risks within this piece. Uh, we've got that uh, floating offshore wind curve coming down reasonably rapidly, but there is a, a quite big gap between that cost and the cost for bottom fixed. So how do you get to market? How do you get someone to invest? Who's going to pay for this? Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, some of the other speakers uh, will be covering that in just a few minutes. Um, so there are some risks in there, but there's also some serious potential for uh, cost to get uh, very much lower. One piece that we should point out though is that there's a lot of uncertainty around this. There obviously uh, are only a few turbines in the water, uh, so long-term cost trends are based on the small amounts of information that are available for those, as well as um, design and uh, sort of technical information about what we assume the projects will look like in the future. Thinking for the moment just about the technical uncertainty, if we look at floater, mooring, installation and OMS cost, um, those are the main uh, pieces with differences between uh, the floating offshore wind and bottom fixed. At the moment, you're looking at uh, a range of about um, between 5 and 10% uh, difference on uh, most of those, slightly uh, less difference are uh, for mooring on the LCOE. Um, but if, uh, and it's kind of a big if, if each of those were independent, 
uh, you could see uh, potentially uh, some quite uh, big differences in LCOE, both um, to the negative that it turns out to be much more expensive than we think, or indeed to the positive that actually there are ways of doing this which are very effective. So uh, watch out, there are still some big uncertainties. Looking at the commercial uncertainty, these are potentially a lot larger. So uh, the chart that you can see in the bottom is my very indicative uh, sketch. Um, market volume is a huge uncertainty. Uh, people talk uh, quite often about 2030, but for floating offshore wind, that's something where you could have as low as three gigawatts or as high as 20 gigawatts, and both of those are reasonable scenarios that various people have predicted. So you can see that there's a huge range there. You've also got the confidence in the supply chain. It feels uh, to me like what we're, we're hearing is lots of confidence. We're seeing some uh, strong investments, uh, but are we seeing the big investments that are needed to get the uh, commercial farms underway? Uh, and finally, in this list, we've got that financing piece. Now, some of that is around the risk that financiers see as fundamental to the technology, and some of that financing risk is where is the revenue coming from? So there we've got the technical uncertainty and the commercial uncertainty. And to give us all a sense of uh, how those uncertainties affect the levelized cost of energy, uh, what I've done is just take the technical uncertainty uh, and do summer squares uh, as though we've got completely independent uh, variation in each of those four categories, and then replot that on the chart that I just showed. Uh, so here we go. That's the technical uncertainties from the previous slide as though they don't interact. Uh, and we've got here uh, two bands, the uh, band for bottom fixed offshore wind as we saw previously, and now we've got a band showing the uncertainty around the floating offshore piece. And looking by the late 2020s, maybe 2028 or so, as though uh, the floating piece is the bottom half of that is covering the top half of the bottom fixed piece. So by that point, certainly lots of sites potentially challenging one another LCOE wise. Okay, uh, and that's what I have to say to everyone around cost of energy for bottom fixed and floating offshore wind. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kate. Um, next is Randy, um, so I will um, switch over to him now. Thanks. And thank you, Emily. Uh, this is Randy Mail with Green Giraffe. Uh, it's good to speak with everyone today. I'm going to speak briefly on the financing of U.S. floating offshore wind projects. And as a, a, a first start and primer, for those of you who are not familiar with Green Giraffe, we are the leading renewable energy financial advisor in the world. We have completed a, a great many transactions. You see dollar volume and, uh, and about 100 professionals across six different countries. But importantly for today's conversation, we also have deep experience and transaction knowledge within the offshore wind space, uh, both in Europe and, and globally. A few topics that I'd like to cover today would include where we stand with respect to floating offshore wind. And indeed, as Allah was mentioning earlier today, we are very much at a turning point for floating offshore wind, so we'll, we'll touch on that. Also, a little bit about how to structure floating offshore wind projects, a brief overview of the equity and debt markets, and then a, a few concluding thoughts. So first, in terms of where we stand with floating offshore wind, we have indeed reached the point where we are observing technical maturity. There are now a number of pilot programs and, and projects which are in operation, demonstration projects which are now in operation, and we are progressing towards the commercialization of projects. And indeed, there are now several hundred megawatts of, of floating offshore wind projects which are in advancing development stages around the world. Allah was, of course, speaking about her project in California, there are others. Uh, 
So we are indeed now at the point where we will be seeing floating offshore wind projects uh, of a commercial scale coming online and that there are now even national siting plans. And again, Allah mentioned just one in California. There are others around the world, as you see here from the slide, which are going to be promoting the further development of offshore wind in some of the deeper waters around the world. So we are now passing the point where it, uh, floating offshore wind was an interesting idea to when floating offshore wind is actually going to become a commercial reality. In terms of structuring, floating offshore wind projects are very much similar to fixed bottom projects. There are two fundamental structures where we have a project company which holds the project development assets, a sponsor who, uh, who is providing the funding for the project. And if this is the entire financing structure, this is what we would refer to as a balance sheet project, as opposed to a structure where we have a lender who would lend to the project company on a non-recourse basis and, and this would be more your typical project finance structure. For some of the early floating offshore wind projects, we would reasonably expect to see, as we did with fixed bottom projects, that those projects may very well be balance sheet financed by some of the larger uh, companies. But as the projects get larger, they will outstrip the balance sheets of even the largest uh, sponsors to be able to finance. And so we will look to see more lenders coming in and we'll see more project finance. So expect that this will be a progression over time with initially perhaps some balance sheet funding, but ultimately non-recourse debt as we typically see in other renewable projects. Another important point to consider with floating offshore wind is the complexity of the contracting schemes. So we have many different important contracts to consider in the financing, the power purchase agreement, uh, the permits from the regulatory authorities, all of the various construction and O and M contracts to build the project, and all together, this creates a tremendous amount of contractual complexity, which also means that in terms of the financing structure, all of these contracts and structures would be uh, would be reviewed. The parties who stand behind them would be diligenced, and so it, it, a tremendously complex financing structure. A lot of time, a lot of professionals involved in, in reviewing all of the various contracts to make sure that indeed they, all the contracts are correct and the terms are correct. Next, a few uh, observations on the equity market. In terms of valuation of floating offshore wind projects, we do see early stage floating offshore wind projects under development around the world. We have advised on several of these financing transactions and it's interesting to see how the financings are being done, the valuations are being calculated. And importantly, as, as pointed out in this first bullet, because those projects are early stage, if a, a party comes in to provide financing, you can't do a typical discounted cash flow analysis for a project because it's still years and years away. There's too much uncertainty. And so that uncertainty translates into risk in the pricing and the valuation of a project. And so what we typically are seeing is either a flat uh, per unit uh, cost for, for, for capacity, so a dollar per megawatt number, or more typically a risk sharing structure where the funding party who's coming in alongside the sponsoring developer is agreeing that they together will bear the risk of the ultimate economics of the project and so defer the, the the, the specific calculation of, of the risk sharing or uh, the, the, the specific determination of the value until that uncertainty is largely removed, which typically is at notice to proceed or the, the commencement of construction. And so there, what you would see is uh, more of a, a, a traditional venture capital private equity model where the sponsor stays in for a promote portion of the project, which might be 15 to 25% of the ownership and the sponsoring uh, funding party would then provide all of the, the rest of the development capital and they'd split that um, the value when there's an exit at notice to proceed or COD or there'd be a buyout from the funding partner. A another important uh, topic here in terms of the valuation of floating offshore winds is that interestingly, we are seeing tremendous interest in this space from pedigreed investors who either, 
uh, have experience in floating or in fixed bottom uh, offshore wind or are experienced in onshore wind but but missed the opportunity so far to do fixed foundation offshore wind and are rather looking to move past fixed uh, foundation uh, offshore wind and participate in the floating market. And here in the United States in particular, we are seeing a number of parties who are very keenly interested in evaluating the markets both on the, the East Coast and the West Coast and opportunities to participate in floating offshore wind projects. So it, uh, it is interesting to see the diversity of those parties who are coming to, to, to evaluate opportunities to participate. And these are also uh, by and large very well uh, regarded and, and as I said, pedigreed investors who have a lot of experience, have a lot of capital and uh, are, are very thoughtful about their approach to the market. So I think it bodes well for projects which are in early stage development that there will be funding parties who will help to finish the development and construct on and operate the projects. Another interesting look at the equity market of the participants in the market and where they tend to align with respect to their, their willingness to participate in different stages of development. So to enter either at early stage or late stage or wait until uh, the construction period to come into the project. And one of the things that, that we do see rather interestingly here in the US is in the, uh, in the utility and oil and gas sector is you see some of the names that we've added over here interest all the way through from early stage through constructing, owning and operating. And some of the newer per participants and entrants into the market, including the utilities, uh, Eversource, PSEG, who have recently entered in partnership with some of the sponsoring uh, companies who have projects on the US East Coast in fixed bottom, we would expect to see the same sort of appetite as we progress towards floating. Then uh, lastly, in terms of the equity market and investor appetite, a, a few additional thoughts. So we are seeing interest across the spectrum of, of large uh, pedigreed investors from utilities to oil and gas and IPPs. Uh, interestingly, not terribly many small developers uh, like Ala's company, there are indeed a few, but partly because in the US, as Ala was mentioning in her earlier talk, the Boehm lease process can be lengthy, can be expensive. Uh, the cost to develop offshore wind is very high. It is difficult for small developers to be able to progress projects very far into the development cycle. And so what we tend to typically more, more often see is, as is the case with, with Alla's company, as she was describing, that a, uh, a partnership would be formed with a larger, uh, uh, more of a balance sheet player who would come in to provide some of that capital. But we do see some small developers operating in the floating offshore space. The other thing that's important, of course, for the equity investors is the degree of political support. And what is terribly important in the United States is the state level support and providing carve outs for offshore wind in their RPS. And that's what we've seen driving the activity here on the East Coast. We anticipate that that will continue to happen. We look forward to Maine, hopefully someday doing that as well. And, and other states as, as well to follow the lead of Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey. So the support of the states is critically important in, in, uh, in the evaluation of the floating offshore wind opportunity to make sure that indeed a project's ultimately going to get built and operating. Then lastly, in terms of the ancillary investments, a lot has been made at various conferences of late about the build out of the uh, the infrastructure, the port facilities to be able to supply the projects, to build the projects, to, to provide O&M support for the projects. For floating offshore, it, it is a little bit different because of course you, you can tow the floating offshore foundations out in and out. So it's a little bit of a different uh, analysis that you undertake as you think about an equity investment opportunity in a floating offshore wind project. But ultimately, the, the coastal infrastructure remains a very important part of, of the evaluation of the likelihood of a project being built and the cost structure for the project. In terms of the debt market, we often get to ask the question whether or not we believe that, in fact, there will be debt available to finance floating offshore wind projects. 
And as we certainly have seen in fixed bottom, there is a, a great deal of interest and appetite on part of commercial lenders to support those projects. We've had a number of discussions with with uh, lenders who have been active in Europe, as well as, as lenders here in the United States who are, uh, are uh, well experienced in financing fixed bottom offshore wind projects. And while floating is still early, and, uh, and as Kate was showing on one of her, her charts in terms of the timeline, we are yet a few years out, though you know, hopefully we'll see some of the floating coming online to beat Kate's chart. But we are indeed finding a lot of interest from lenders in this space beginning to do their diligence on floating offshore wind and becoming smart on it, understanding what diligence is going to be required, socializing some of those issues at the highest levels of the banks so that as these first projects come forward and are looking for debt financing, we do anticipate that lenders will be ready to provide it. Um, that said, in terms of the terms that we would anticipate seeing, we do expect that the terms would be a bit more conservative than what we are currently seeing in fixed bottom. But at the end of the day, uh, we do expect that that debt will be available, debt will be reasonably priced, and financing will be able to be secured. So a few concluding thoughts. Uh, importantly, funding is available uh, for floating offshore wind projects. So we see this both on the equity side, uh, as I said, on the debt side, it's a little early yet, but we're certainly seeing enough interest that we feel confident that by the time the projects mature and require debt financing and move into construction, that that debt financing will be available. And not surprisingly, we would anticipate that the most advanced technologies would be the first to secure financing. Though one of the interesting things that we see in the space, and, and this was, I think, highlighted both in, in Allah's presentation and in Kate's, is the difference that we see across the spectrum of technologies and whether that's spar technology or, or semi-submersible, that it's going to take some time to see how the, the, the technologies shake out in terms of who is the winner, who, which ones are the most financeable, which ones secure the best financing, which ones deploy. And, and so it, as well, in order to be able to support the financing and, and whether that's debt or equity, the due diligence is going to be extremely important, particularly for the early floating offshore wind projects and, and detailed review of the contracts as discussed on the earlier page and the complexity of the contracts will be particularly important. But we do see across the spectrum different players interested in different stages of the development to provide financing for the projects. And at the end of the day, just as we saw with fixed bottom and with onshore wind, good projects will get financed. So with that, Emily, I will turn it back to you. Great. Thank you, Randy. Um, I don't think we have time for many questions, but if you have specific questions for specific speakers, then I advise um, that you send them an email which will be attached to their, um, their slides, which will be sent to everyone next week with the live recording. Um, so we've come to the end of the Future is Floating webinar. First of all, thank you so much to all of the panelists for all of that expert insights into the floating wind market. Um, once again, floating wind is one of the main discussions that we will be addressing at the US Offshore Wind 2020 conference in Boston, June 18th and 19th. So if you enjoyed this webinar, then please join us at the event. Each of these speakers will also be there speaking and presenting. So come and join them. Um, on that note, for this week only, we have released um, a set number 60 free VIP conference ticket upgrades for the first people who register before this Friday, the 28th. This allows you direct access to hundreds of offshore wind sea level executives in the VIP lounge plus you'll receive the full executive experience with access to enhanced all-day catering fast track reg registration with no queuing, reserved front row seats in conference sessions and charging stations with relaxed seating throughout the day. So if you register today via the registration page on the US Offshore Wind Conference website using the code 5092VIP, that code is also on the website, and um, this offer expires on Friday. So book now if you think you're going to come. <laughs>
Great. See you all there, and thank you again to all the speakers.